Hey guys, welcome back. I have got the story written. I don't have it typed up yet. Um, <clears throat> and it will move kind of quickly because I didn't have the time to uh, spend as much time on it as I would have liked. But it ties up loose ends. So, um, if you remember, as Rhoda has told the story, it, has, it goes on till like October of 2020. So this will be March of 2021 when things, you know, start heating back up. And remember, our detective's name is John Perry. So, I was contacted 3rd of March 1921 by the cousin of Rose Binder named Alice. She had explained the previous goings-on on the property of Lower Craftley, the mansion known as Craftley Hall. I sat wondering why she was telling me a story that had happened some months before that seemed to have been resolved by none other than Ernest Barundle and his team of psychic investigators. They were well known to the police force, though I had never worked with them directly. Alice explained that a few days prior to her coming to see me, strange activity was occurring once more. She also explained that Mr. Brundle and his team were away on another case in London and would not return for several weeks. She appeared to be very distraught <clears throat> and very gaunt, almost ill. I could tell that she was deeply troubled and in need of some assistance. I assured her that I would investigate and see if anything could be determined. My initial thought was that someone was s someone having heard the stories of the hauntings was playing a trick on them as they were beginning to feel settled after the previous ordeals. I agreed to come the next day to see what I could find out. Before Alice left, she gave me a copy of Ernest Brundle's files and the evidence he collected when his team investigated months prior. The file was an interesting one with photographs of where the ghosts had written on bathroom mirrors, broken dishes, a torn journal, and get away under torn wallpaper in the servants' quarters of the home. There was no reason listed as to why that part of the home was in such disarray. Alice had said when she was explaining the story that she found it odd. I had to agree. The next morning, mind you, this is written kind of like it would be in a uh, investigative file. The next morning, I made my way to Cravley Hall to meet with Alice and her cousin, Rose Binder. I was informed that Jeffrey was at the factory and would not be home until late in the evening. Rose had still had an eye mask on as her eyes still had swelling from working at the factory. Alice had explained quietly as Rose had turned to let me into the house. It was no secret that some people who had worked at the factory had suffered some of the same ailments, including lung problems, jaw pain, headaches, swollen eyes, fatigue, and weakness. Such was the life of factory workers in different areas as well. It was work that was steadily available and many families relied on the income to be able to live. I nodded softly to Alice to indicate I had heard her and would not comment to Mrs. Binder of her plight so as not to embarrass her. I sat across from the women at the kitchen table and listened to both as they explained the things that had happened in the week prior to contacting me. Rose was pushed as she was cleaning up after the workmen who recently rebuilt the servants' quarters. She was there alone as Alice was outside getting washing from the line and Jeffrey had not yet returned from work. About an hour later, Alice went into the area as her bedroom was in the new quarters as well as Rose and Jeffrey's room at the end of the hallway. As she was putting her clothes away from the line, she heard screaming. Thinking it was Rose, she ran to her room to find her asleep. She searched the entire house but found nothing. She started to wonder if she was imagining things after everything that had happened prior. They had done all they promised. <clears throat> and placed a plaque to remember those who had passed from the plague and had left the old church and the cemetery. She hadn't yet known of Rose being pushed by an unseen force, which wasn't something that had happened before. I asked to see the new quarters. Alice got up for me to follow her. It was a long corridor with several rooms on each side and one room at the very end of the hallway, which was Rose and Jeffrey's room. Alice's room was the first on the right. 
I had asked if she was leaving to go back to her family soon. She explained that Rose still needed her due to her health, and she had no plans for leaving any time soon. I only asked if she had a suitcase sitting in a chair by her bed, as if she hadn't fully unpacked yet. Perhaps she hadn't, as she could be asked to leave if Rose didn't need her anymore. The room next to hers was a washroom with a pitcher and bowl stand attached to a mirror and a commode. There was another room on the left-hand side with a bathtub. The rest of the three rooms on the left were bedrooms, and another room on the right was a sitting room with a couple of bookshelves, chairs, a fireplace, and an old-looking bureau which Alice said was already in the house when she moved in. If you guys remember, Rhoda had explained that that was the bureau that the previous owners had, and they, there was a locked drawer. <clears throat> She explained that there was a bunch of papers from Dr. and Violet Millsand who originally built the house. Something about this bureau was puzzling me. Why would Jeffrey only keep this piece of furniture and not others? She had also explained one of the drawers were locked and no one knew what was in there. <clears throat> Why was it locked? Where was the key? What secrets does it hold? None of the rooms felt out of the ordinary except for the sitting room and Alice's bedroom. The air felt different in those rooms. It seemed close, but cooler in temperature, in some way, though there didn't seem to be a draft from the windows. From there, I searched the main part of the house, but found nothing out of the ordinary. A kitchen, dining room, parlor, and the former bedroom turned into a library. It felt airy and normal, as any house does. I had asked if anything new had happened <clears throat> in these areas or if they had seen any of the previous ghosts that were there before. Alice explained that only the children have been seen since, and not all of them. The girl in the garden is a frequent visitor, and the young boy in the doorway has been seen since. It made me wonder if they weren't plague victims, but had died there throughout the 55 years that the house was empty. Well, the groundskeeper was there during that time until his passing, but I didn't know his name. I only knew there had been one, as the outside of the house was well taken care of throughout the years from pictures I had seen. Nothing had happened while I was there, however. I promised I'd try to do some research and see what I could find out on my end. I asked to be informed if any other activity occurred. They agreed, and I was on my way. The next morning, I made my way into the village to speak with some of the older people who frequented the dining establishment for breakfast. I was informed the groundskeeper's name had been Thomas, though no one knew his last name. I had wondered if there had been any newspaper articles that may have mentioned him, so I went to the news agent's office to see if I could find anything useful there. I found the story, uh, story of Dr. Milsan's death and of Violet leaving to live with her sister in another village close by. It stated she was 13 when they first married and he was gone before she was 16. That was a common occurrence back then. It wasn't unusual for 13-year-olds to be married. They were considered women back then, and if you got married any later than 16, you were considered an old maid. <clears throat> it briefly mentioned the caretaker would be staying on to take care of the grounds, but the name was never mentioned. I found no other news stories other than when the binders purchased the home and where the ghostly case was solved by Mr. Brundle and his team. There was a picture of the groundskeeper, however, so I searched everything I could find on anyone named Thomas in the area. I had spent several hours searching through everything and was feeling dejected until I came across this picture again. It was the same picture as was in the original story, but this was an obituary. His name was Thomas Binder. I had wondered if Jeffrey was a relative of his and if that was why he decided to purchase the home. I made a mental note to call round to his place and ask. Something felt like it was starting to kick into place, though I wasn't quite sure what it was as yet. I went around to Crafley Hall at 6.30 that evening to question Jeffrey about Thomas. 
He had stated he'd never heard of him, which I found odd as he'd only passed a couple of years prior to their owning the house. Rose seemed excited to learn more about a possible family member as Jeffrey's parents were gone. Alice had a look of trepidation about her. I understood the look all too well, as I wasn't buying what Jeffrey was selling. Something about him seemed off in a way I couldn't explain. I asked to stay informed, and Alice saw me to the door. I inquired if she ever saw a key that could unlock the bureau. She informed me that Jeffrey kept a small key on his watch chain, but that she didn't know what it went to. There was only a front door key and a back door key when Rose and Jeffrey moved in, according to Rose. I asked Alice if she thought she could get the key somehow to see if it would work in the bureau. She stated she'd have to think of something, as he was careful about that key. Somehow I knew this would tell me the information I needed to break the case open. It may not explain everything, but at least something. A few days later, as I was sitting at my desk writing notes on another case, I was disturbed to see a very distraught and frightened Alice. She had said she saw the young girl from the garden tied up in her room, though she could see through her. She'd never seen activity like this before. She stated the girl looked like she was screaming, though she couldn't hear a sound. She had also stated that Rose's headaches were getting worse as the activity was getting more violent. Alice had been pushed <clears throat> also when in the sitting room with Rose. Jeffrey had stated that he hadn't seen or heard anything since the plague victims. I had wondered if the activity in Rose's headaches were connected or mere coincidence. Perhaps the treatment for her eyes caused headaches, though I didn't know if she was getting treatment. Alice also shakingly handed me a small key. She stated that she was able to pickpocket Jeffrey as she pretended to stumble into him. She was worried what would happen if he found out it was her who'd taken it. I assured her it would be fine as the key would be returned to him. We left together and made our way to Crafley Hall, where I informed Rose that I needed to see the sitting room again. She nodded to Alice to lead the way. She followed behind us. Jeffrey was still at the factory, so we should be okay for the moment. Upon entering, I procured the key from my pocket and unlocked the bureau drawer. Rose gasped and looked to Alice as she nodded. Upon opening the drawer, I discovered pictures of Thomas Binder and none other than Violet Millsand. She'd never left the house. There was a picture of the two who looked to be in their thirties with a baby. Written on the picture was Violet, Thomas, and Jeffrey. <clears throat> there were other pictures in the bureau, including one of Rose, Alice, the girl in the garden, and the young boy who'd been seen at the back door. There were several pictures of Jeffrey as a boy and a diary that had been written by Jeffrey himself. It talked of him growing up in Crafley Hall and how the servants' quarters were his playrooms and how he'd killed all the pets he had as a boy and wondered why his mother never caught on. She had died when she was 60 of heart failure, leaving a 27-year-old Jeffrey in the house with his ailing father who died two years prior to Rose moving in with Jeffrey. He talked of killing several children since he was 10 years old until he was 27. The killing seemed to stop when he started the factory. It talked of him meeting Rose and originally wanting her to be his victim, to him falling in love with her. He thought when Alice would he thought then Alice would become his victim, but couldn't kill her as she meant so much to Rose. Rose stood stunned as at the information she was given about her husband. The diary also stated that Violet never married Thomas as she was afraid she'd lose the home and the money left behind from her first husband, Doctor Millsand. I also learned that Thomas killed him because he was slowly poisoning Violet with the amitriptyline. He'd been in love with Violet for years before they became a couple. He continued to care for the grounds and to do other odd jobs to support them as Violet didn't want to spend much of the money that was left to her so as not to arouse suspicion, which explains such disarray to the mansion over the years and Jeffrey's evil ways. I arrested Jeffrey on all the murders that he confessed to in his diary, and for the drugging of Rose he'd done himself to keep her from becoming suspicious. 
Rose had agreed to stay his wife until he was hanged so she could keep the house and the factory as she had found out she was expecting. As for Alice, she remained close to her cousin but later became Mrs. John Perry. So there is the end. It ties up all the loose ends of whatnot. As I stated before, the the story was a wonderful story, but, you know, I had to make it a little darker. And though I could have made it a lot darker, I didn't want to, as some people don't like real creepy things or, um, you know, murder mysteries and things like that. So, I, I tried to keep it as tame as possible, but I had to shorten it. Like I said, I could have drawn it out quite a bit. Um, but I will work on the ephemera part. Um, because the girl in the garden and the boy at the door, you know, will be added. And, um, I do have some other pictures of, uh, what I think to be, um, Violet and, uh, Thomas. I only picked the name Thomas because it seemed to be a common name back then. Not because of our Thomas, but, you know, like I said, it was a common name back then in, in England as well as other areas including the United States, so, um, <clears throat> so anyway, that is the story that I have come up with, and then I will finish the ephemera to go into the book, and then, and then, uh, our Thomas will receive the book, but thank you guys so much for all the sweet comments, uh, to Thomas, he appreciates every one of them, he thought they were very nice, and he says thank you, so much um and i don't know if he wants to do any um any more crafting or not in here he took his book home with him so i'm assuming that he wants to work on it a little bit while he's there and he may bring it back i don't he hasn't said so i'm not really sure uh what he wants to do with it or not but um i guess we'll find out um uh, but he he may decide that he wants to do some more crafting with me which is fine um so I got I I guess when we come back we'll finish that up and then we'll start another project. So I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see you guys back here again really soon. Bye.